Welcome to the Glamorous Podcast, a space centering the refined, cultured, and connected Black American woman. Thanks so much for joining me today. Let's get into it. Happy Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a.k.a. Happy MLK Day. Today, I want to discuss three facts about MLK, or rather, three different, two different perspectives and an interesting fact. Fact number one. MLK was a member of the Negro elite. His father was a Baptist minister who was so inspired by the Protestant reformer Martin Luther that he changed his name from Michael King Sr. to Martin Luther King Sr. And he also changed his son's name to what we know today as Martin Luther King Jr. Now this is very noteworthy because... Back then, most people don't even didn't even know like what was the Protestant Reformation all about, you know, let alone to know who Martin Luther is. I mean, even today people don't know very much about the Protestant Reformation and versus the Catholic Church and how we have all these different denominations. So to really be so inspired by this man who was white, I think Martin Luther may have even been German. To the point that you are going as a grown American Negro man going to change your name (laughs) to the name of a white man who lived so long ago and not just change your name, but you're going to change your son who I think, um, I think he was five at the time. Like that is a very, um, elite and, um, a very rare thing to do. It definitely was not common. And also his father, in addition to changing his name, his father was very ambitious. Um, MLK Sr. was born to sharecropper parents. And he later went on to graduate from Morehouse College, which um, at the time was very esteemed. I mean, some people may argue it's not as esteemed and prestigious um, as it was back then. But back at that time, it was very, very... um, the place to be one of the top universities. It's an all male university. And it was definitely um, a place for social networking. Um, Also to network academically, people were changing or, you know, swapping out different thoughts and um, ideas. And it definitely was the who's who place of American Negro men. And also we're thinking about a time Um, during Jim Crow where people are getting, you know, college degrees. So this is a very big deal to come from people who were sharecroppers and on your own go out and attain this type of education. MLK's mother, Alberta King, was also a college graduate. She graduated from what is now known as Hampton University with a teaching certificate. So he came from two college-educated parents in the early 1900s. And so this is a very, very, very big deal. Alberta King's father, Reverend Adam Williams, was the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so this was very significant. And, you know, you also have to go to MLK Sr. because he had his eye on the prize Um, to marry the daughter of or a pastor's daughter of a prestigious church such as Ebenezer Baptist Church. And then he later became the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. So, you know, in in my opinion, my speculation, um, MLK Sr. saw Alberta and was like, this is my way to be upwardly mobile. I'm going to marry her and then her father will pass down the church to me. And then we know later that um, MLK Jr. became the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so coming from a lineage of church pastors was very significant in that era. I mean, it's significant somewhat in this era, but, you know, when I think of pastor, I mean, when if you're 
you know, a younger person, you think of a pastor today, they probably don't have the best reputation. I mean, we're coming off of mega church pastors like T.D. Jakes, who I think was just in some sort had some accusations floating around recently. You know, the Jamal Bryants, and then you had the the Eddie Longs, and you know, before that, you had, you know, like the Father Divines and the Sweet Daddy Graces. So, you know, it's been a couple of... <laughs> It's been a couple of um, pastors which are like, Ooh. but back in the day, the pastors of the black church, they really served as like the kings of the Negro community. You know, they were often liaisons to like the white establishment and um, other white people in the community. If they wanted to get some messaging out to the black community, they would go to the black church. And during that time, the pastors had a lot of influence. Um, one thing that happened during the eugenics movement with Margaret Sanger, who created, um, what is it called? Parenthood or Planned Parenthood. I can't think of the name right now, but that um, organization, when she was trying to kill off black people, via what they were now well now they call it population control she went to the black churches and had them promote the idea of family planning you know passing out various forms of contraception um and really trying to stop these really big families because back in the day people would have like you know 10 15 sometimes even 20 kids and so they went this is a known fact that the margaret sangers of the world went to black preachers and the preachers would tell their parishioners you know to hold off and let's because of economic reasons or whatever to be more res not responsible but try and have less children so back in the day like a black pastor especially of a church like Ebenezer Baptist Church in um, an area of what was known as black progress you have major econ or in educational institutions and a lot of social networking black businesses i mean even today like atlanta is it was known as the black mecca but you know we could debate that in another video <laughs> but um like I was saying, coming from that lineage of church pastors, um, oh, the church pastors were often the liaisons to the white establishment. Um, the pastors back then also worked in politics. If there was legislation going around locally, they, and even today we still have this, they would bring out um, different candidates to the church or if things were going on um the community members outside of the black community, which was main, which was white people at the time, would go to the black pastors and say, hey, um, this is happening, you know, alert your people about that. Um, or if, you know, there was a company that was looking for workers, they could go to the pastors. The pastors would say, hey, this company is hiring. If you're looking for work, go there. So the black church was a place, it was not just a religious institution dealing with, you know, the matters of God and morality, but it also was a networking hub for employment. It also was a place um, that if you came from a rural community or maybe, um, a place that didn't have a lot of access to privileges. It was a place of refinement. Um, Sarah Breadlove, which we now know as Madam C.J. Walker, she talks about how the church and the women in the church really helped to build up the Madame character that she later um, came into. But it was a place of refinement. And the church was the moral authority. So if a pastor said something, this is what we need to do as a people, you know, the pastor, you know, <laughs> the influence was really, really big. Um, another part of becoming, also being, coming from a lineage of church pastors, um, parishioners of the church often regard the entire family of a pastor in high esteem. You know, you have the preacher's kid <laughs> who are like notorious, now, who are known as being notoriously bad. But, you know, if you were a preacher's kid, the people in the church, you know, they would look after you. There was some grace extended. So MLK was a part of the Negro elite. I mean, he was really, really clicked in. 
And then outside of the church, he lived in an affluent black community networking with the Who's Who's. And in having the economic advantage and esteem of being a pastor's son, um, yet being subjugated by demeaning policies and laws such as segregation, that really bothered um, MLK. And so MLK, he started off, his initial goal was to end the indecency caused by segregation by challenging the laws. Um, or what we later know as challenging civil rights. And so um, Martin was a part of a generation of black elites who were kind of creeping into white spaces and institutions as the token Negroes. And I'm not just talking about him, but his contemporaries. Um, or the surrounding white communities would allow a few of the upper crust black Americans in their spaces, but outside of those spaces, they wouldn't be the treated the same as their white um, counterparts of the same economic class. And that really kind of bothers people. You know, that's one thing about being the token Negro or when you get you know, you're amongst white people and you're the only one. You do get these benefits, but once you get outside of that group, you know, you're just treated <laughs> the way you would have been treated had you not been in that group. And sometimes those white people, um, you know, you were a palatable Negro. They would entertain you, but you never quite will feel as equal to them. So imagine being a part of the black bourgeoisie and having all the money, the privilege, and the education, the moral character, um, yet having lower class white people being able to call you boy, um, or you can't go floss your money in one of their stores. Um, the psychological effects of that on some of the black elite, um, they wanted to have no restrictions. And so that was one of the things MLK really talked about. Um, in his letters from Birmingham, he stated, while replying to white clergymen, um, white and some were, I think, like Jewish rabbis or something, they had wrote some sort of a letter to him saying to kind of back off of the peaceful protest and the demonstrations and just to handle things through the court and so while he was in jail in Birmingham I think he didn't have a permit to protest and he was they jailed put him in jail he wrote this letter and in it he talked about um, black people suffering from the disease of segregation and he went on to say and he's addressing these um, clergymen I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at a whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers mothering in the airtight cage of poverty, in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky. And see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking in agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the un uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy. However old you are and your last name becomes John. And when your wife and mother never 
are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. So MLK was really wanting to stop those um, humiliating experiences. Being of the black bourgeoisie and heir to that, you know, not like his parents who had to, or his father who came from sharecroppers who worked so hard. Typically when you're the heir of something, you kind of want to push it forward. I mean, some people kind of wallow, not wallow, but enjoy their privileges and stop, but it's like you have everything but this one psychological aspect. So that was his point of view. But all of Black America um, was suffering this humiliation. But being of the Black elite, he really had the economic advantages. While other people did not have the economic advantages. Which, this is a very interesting fact to note that he was from the elite because... He had money, but everybody didn't. So the original civil rights movement that started decades earlier was really about an economic issue. Um, black Americans were not receiving their fair share of tax dollars that were distributed to their community, which resulted in unequal distribution of public tax dollars. So when you had Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, it was noted that the separate but equal doctrine that came from the Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1896 was not true. So their goals to desegregate was so that the, the tax dollars would be desegregated. MLK coming from this elite enclave was really caring about this psychological effect. Like he didn't necessarily care about the economic issue because he came from money and affluent. Influ I mean affluence and he had influence. And so he was trying to deal with this social thing and his doctorate being, I want to say it was in theology, he had all of these theories about integration. But when you live in a secluded black enclave, I mean, we see that even now with some of the middle class black people um, who haven't had to encounter the mores of ghetto life. Like they're very much, um, a lot of them live by theory, but you haven't lived how other people live. So money is not a thing. And so you're not dealing with the issues of poverty. But those original people that started the civil rights movement were dealing with economics. They wanted their shares of tax dollars to deal with their streets, to fund their schools, to pay their teachers properly, and to have their society amongst themselves. They weren't necessarily caring so much about social integration. Yes, Jim Crow was humiliating this, that, and the third, but when you go back and review some of the notes on like the black towns of like the Greenwoods and, um, even like Rosewood or even the place that Zora Neale Hurston um, grew up in. They talk about how wonderful it is, was in their black community, being surrounded by all these black people and how they have what they needed. It was just, you know, in some of those all black towns, they didn't have, they were paying taxes, but they weren't getting their fair share. Then you had, you know, in um, Tulsa, they um, were kind of the self sustaining enclave and so after the um brown versus the board of education case in 1954 black people around the country were like yeah we need to start getting our money <laughs> we need to start getting these tax dollars flowing our way and it started to um actually put fear in the white people around them you know these are you know 1954 
you have the Irish and the Italians and the Polish and the Jewish who just became white in the 1940s. So black people talking about getting their share of tax dollars. Well, they came from Italy, Ireland, Poland to get all of the wealth that black people had amassed. And they came here to get this thing called whiteness in whiteness. And so if the black people are trying to get their fair share, then their whiteness that they just got really wouldn't mean too much. And so this whole thing of dealing with economics fear really sparked fear in the country. Um, because if you could have black, you know, Wall Streets all over again, like <laughs> the economic piece is what really frightens them. So it is my speculation that this is why MLK was kind of pushed to the forefront, you know, as people were talking about money in the 50s um, in amassing and kind of getting the money just for the black community they weren't talking about social integration you have this person from the black bourgeoisie who is hobnobbing with white people here and there and kind of probably desiring to be in white spaces or what he says amalgamate and create this new unified thing this new thing with the black people and white people and we'll be all one i mean we'll have some cultural differences but to come together he had a different agenda and it's my speculation that that's why um he became somewhat deified as he is today and so um later we know that he started to understand the economic issues as he began to travel outside of his affluent black enclaves of the South. And he went around the country. He started to see like, wow, you know, I'm sure he probably heard of poor people. I mean, I know he knew black people because everyone in Georgia, obviously Georgia has some very rural areas, some very poor people. Um, poor black people. So he understands poverty. But um, once he started to go you know, to the deep, deep, deep South, um, he started to see that, hey, we need, the our people need money. And especially when he went to Chicago, we know <laughs> that's when he was like, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> this social um, integration idea and just focusing on, you know, the psychological aspects of segregation is one thing, but, you know, the slums in Chicago, excuse me, in a lot of the northern inner cities, he was very taken back by that. And I think that's even like today, I think, you know, the South is really its own place. And you and the, also in the South, you have the numbers when you go to Chicago, well, Chicago does have the numbers, but places like New York and New Jersey, and then, you know, out here on the West Coast, you don't necessarily have all the numbers and it is a different fight. So I think towards the end of his career um his he really started to mature and you have to remember MLK was doing this he was in his 30s um and so he was becoming in you know becoming a man and his perspective was no longer just like his um theological um theories that he learned in college he was actually getting a first-hand education and we know later on um one of his last speeches he talked about all of the welfare that as he called them the european peasants received from the government when they got here and he informed the world the next time that they march on washington that we are coming to get our check that's right mlk was for reparations reparations um, so that's an important thing as we talk about MLK. And if you are enjoying this content, I need you to make sure that you like the video and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. You're listening to Glamorous, a space centering the refined, cultured, and connected Black woman. The last thing that I want to highlight about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is that most people don't know this, but you know that famous song in the black community that we sing on everybody's birthday, written by Stevie Wonder. It's actually a song about ML, the MLK holiday becoming a holiday. One of the um, passages in the songs, it says, I just never understood how a man who died for good 
could not have a day that would be set aside for his recognition. So the next time you listen to happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday a (laughs) make sure that you take a moment and listen to the lyrics so thanks so much for listening to this i hope you enjoy your mlk day and please make sure to leave a comment if you feel so inclined thanks for taking the time to spend your mlk day with me and um hopefully these facts gave you a different you know lens to view him as i know today a lot of people will be talking about how he had this dream for all but you know i might have to do a part two to this but i gotta get this in too is that he wasn't talking about all most of the people who are trying to co-op his legacy were not even in this country when he was around he was talking about black in white or white in negroes as we were known at the time and he was talking about our legacy of slavery the color of our skin and how the people who are running this country and all the people they let in have um, are psychologically terrorizing us and how these laws are immoral and unjust and how we are entitled Um, to certain benefits as being citizens and also we need reparations and so people today you know and another thing I don't like that people do is they try to kind of like malign him and yeah I mean you can criticize him but some of the critiques that I've seen have just been really really tough I mean you have to put it in context this man coming up and you know coming from an elite background and being in his 30s like are you even worthy to critique him would you put your life on the line this man was a husband he was a father of little kids and he went around the country for something he believed in you know a lot of people can critique him today but you know he was outside outside he wasn't online talking a bunch of stuff he was outside and as we think about celebrating his legacy, you know, what you can do, practical things you can do, you know, we need to be invoking our civil rights. You know, a lot of the gains that we got were because of legislation. We had attorneys like Thurgood Marshall, who led the case in Brown versus the Board of Education to challenge these things. Are you invoking your civil rights? Do you file lawsuits? Do you submit complaints um when we got our rights it was these big case files of things that we had filed we didn't get justice immediately but going through the civic civic process during loss doing lawsuits etc things were happening and i think something that we need to do is lean into our civic engagement whether it's our local politics make sure we're focusing on our ballot locally Making sure that when you are um, aggrieved or mistreated and fairly, take the time to fill out the complaint forms. It may not happen today (laughs) as far as justice, but keeping that record, those are very tangible things we can do. And the last thing we can do to honor his legacy um, every day is to make sure that we protect the narrative. Um, Let's not let... Um, the foreigners who are just now getting here continue to steal his legacy. You know, you had the the DACA people calling themselves dreamers, trying to align themselves with MLK. He couldn't have been dreaming about you because you weren't here. And if you were a Hispanic DACA person, you were listed as white. So you were one of the immigrants that he was talking about. And so we have to protect his narrative. He wasn't... Um, You know, what he started off as, as I've highlighted in this post, yes, he was definitely trying to, as he said, he was trying to combat the indecency and the humiliation that we suffered from the segregation laws. And he did hope to create this new amalgam between white and black. But as he grew older and as he said my dream I'm afraid it has become a nightmare (laughs) and you know we need to deal with these economics we need to capture that because that is still very much so 
the same. So I hope you once again enjoy this day. I'm done for real, for real. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you like the video and have a great MLK day.